Tonight, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm honored to welcome former Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich, back to Cambridge. He's here tonight to discuss his new book, Aftershock, The Next Economy and America's Future. In Aftershock, Robert Reich urges us to reconceptualize our economy, to reassess the fundamental structural issues that have led us to where we are today. Professor Reich draws parallels between now and the Great Depression and studies how the economy influence, influences political and societal concerns. Publishers Weekly calls Mr. Reich's thesis well, argue, well argued and frighteningly plausible, while Kirkus calls the book lucid and cogent. Robert Reich, as you well know, is one of the world's greatest economic policymakers and political theorists. He's a professor of public policy at UC Berkeley and has served in three national administrations, most recently as Secretary of Labor under President Clinton. His books include The Work of Nations, Locked in the Cabinet, and Supercapitalism. He's co-founding editor of the American Prospect magazine. His public radio marketplace commentaries can be found online at publicradio.com. He blogs actively at robertreich.org, where you can also find links to his also active Twitter and Facebook pages. I'm so very thrilled that he's back in Cambridge with us tonight. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Robert Reich. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, thank you. It's so nice to see you. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, thank you, Heather, and thanks, uh, thank you for the Harvard Bookstore, uh, an independent bookstore that we all are going to support and continue to support because we believe in independent bookstores. And thank you, Brattle Theater, an independent theater. Uh, and thank you for coming tonight. I, um, I, I have a piece of good news I want to share with you, first of all. And I actually, I read this a, a few days ago, and that is that the Great Recession is over. <laughs> Did you read that? Uh, uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, here in Cambridge, uh, eight very prominent academic economists uh, looking at the data. And uh, actually, they did find that the economy uh, continued to shrink until June of 2009, and then actually started to expand again. So that June 2009 was the, was the absolute worst point. And we are in, technically, we're in a recovery. But of course, it's a technical recovery. It's not really a recovery. I mean, we don't feel that we are in a recovery, I, unless, how many of you feel like you're in a recovery? I mean, a recovery, economic recovery. Maybe you're in a, a different kind of recovery. Uh, I, uh, I, I mean, in this great recession, what I say in the book, and I'm going to talk for maybe 20 minutes or 25 minutes, and I want to get your questions. And then those of you uh, who are interested in pursuing this book, I hope you are. Uh, I'll sign your books, and, and, and uh, hopefully you'll buy it as well. Uh, <laughs> has been, the Great Recession has been just something far different and more dramatic and powerful than any of the previous five recessions that at least I remember. Uh, it has mown down everything in its path. Uh, some of you uh, remember me personally. You remember three years ago, I was five foot ten. Uh, it's not, actually, it's not a laughing matter. Uh, and I don't mean to make it a laughing matter. Uh, what I try to do in the book is peel back the onion layers, as it were, metaphorically, to explain what actually all this is, why we are in an aftershock. I'm, I'm, uh, can you all see me up there? Yes? OK. Well, I, actually, there may be many of you I can't see, and you can't see me. Well, the question is why we are in an aftershock, uh, an aftershock that seems to continue to go on of high unemployment and low economic growth. Uh, the last quarter, the second quarter of this year, we were growing at an annualized rate of 1.6%, which may sound good. I mean, we are in the right direction, I suppose, as the president says. Uh, but at 1.6% growth, we're staying in the hole. Uh, we are not going to see unemployment come down. We're not generating a lot of new jobs. Uh, this is an anemic recovery at best. And there's a, there's a possibility of falling into what's called a double dip. That is another recession. But actually, for most Americans, we never got out of the first dip. Uh, we're still there. And why is that? And why is there this aftershock? And what can we do about it? 
And what does it have to do with the ugliness that we are now experiencing in American politics? The kind of, the anger, the politics of anger. Is there any relationship between politics and economics? Of course there is. Well, let me suggest to you that obviously this whole thing came to a head and really did have a lot to do with Wall Street's excesses. We know that now, but that was only the proximate cause of what happened. Wall Street did go crazy, but Wall Street has gone crazy for many years, and Wall Street made a lot of bad loans, and it should have made those loans. There should have been better federal government regulation. Alan Greenspan should not have lowered interest rates so low and allowed banks to do what they were doing without regulation. Sure, we all know that, but that's not the most important thing that has happened. Peel back the onion once, and under that first layer, you see that Americans, and this is something that I remember Paul Volcker saying, the first meeting we all had as his economic advisory group after uh, the election, before he became president, uh, Obama and Paul Volcker and Laura Tyson and I and a few others, Paul Volcker said, the real problem here is America has lived the, Americans have lived beyond their means for too long. That's, it's sort of a, this is the day of reckoning. That's what, that's what the problem is. And it is true, again, uh, too many people had too many loans that they couldn't afford to pay back, and uh, they took on mortgages they couldn't afford to pay back. And yes, that's true, too, but that's, again, that's only another layer of the onion. Peel that back and ask yourself why, given a growing economy for 30 years, Americans felt it so necessary to go so deep into debt. That is the most interesting question to me. Why was the so-called recovery of 2001-2007 such a phantom recovery in the sense that nothing really happened? Uh, the median wage of Americans actually dropped, adjusted for inflation. Uh, very few jobs were created relative to the years of the Clinton administration during which I was labor secretary, at least part of those. 22 million net new jobs. Thank you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, we had, I wish we could claim credit but a lot of it had to do with economic conditions that are only tangentially related to public policies, and I'll get back to that. Uh, but wait a minute, uh, something was fundamentally askew long before 2007, 2008. Something was getting off track in a very powerful and large way. Uh, when I was Secretary of Labor, I remember we used to look at distributional issues. Uh, that is, who's getting what and where is the income going? And I remember sitting with people in the Bureau of La uh, Labor Statistics uh, wondering why there seemed to be this widening gap between per capita productivity, which continued to rise, and actually wages, median wages, uh, still seemed pretty much stuck in the mud. Uh, why was this going on? No, it, Continued to, that gap continued to widen, but even in the early 90s, uh, it, looked, uh, it looked peculiar. It, it was not what we had expected. It was something new, something strange was going on. In fact, for 30 years, beginning in the late 1970s and extending right up to 2007, the beginning of the Great Recession, for 30 years, median wages of men Median, I mean smack in the middle, equal number above, equal below. The median wage of men adjusted for inflation went nowhere. Today, the typical male worker is earning less adjusted for inflation than he did, at least a typical male worker did, 30 years ago. What's going on? There is something very profound that is going on, and I suggest that what is going on fundamentally affected and came to a kind of a, a final tumultuous end in 2008, and we are still living with that. And let me explain. Come back in history. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, median wages were going up very fast. As the American economy grew, 
everybody grew along with it. It was a time of enormous prosperity, mass production, mass consumption. Now, it wasn't great. I'm not trying to glorify the 50s or 60s. I mean, there was a time of, of still racism, a uh, time when women, uh, there was a lot of prejudice in the workforce. There was a kind of mean-spiritedness. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you watch Mad Men, uh, but it, it, was not, it was not exactly a wonderful period of time. But from an economic and social standpoint, we at least tried to expand prosperity, and prosperity was fairly widely available, at least by the 60s and early 1970s, the American economy did live up to the ideal of something called the American dream. There was very rapid social mobility. A lot of things were working right, and we were working at least moving in the right direction with regard to opportunity and equal opportunity. And then something happened in the late 70s, early 1980s, and wages flattened for men Typical American families did three things to keep up their purchasing power in light of this fairly sudden reversal. Number one, what was the first thing? Coping mechanism. Women went into paid work in large numbers. Even women with young children went into paid work in large numbers. Beginning in the late 70s, early 1980s, I wish I could tell you that the reason that women crowded into paid work beginning that time was because of the wonderful professional opportunities open to so many women. That was not the major reason. It was to prop up living standards and incomes that were being now hit by a stagnation of male wages. Coping mechanism number two. You can only go so far, by the way, with coping mechanism number one, because in the late 60s uh, and early 70s, something in the order of 24, 25% of women with young children were in the workforce, in paid work, and by the 1990s, by the first decade of this century, we were up to about 60 or 65% of women with young children. There's just a limit to how far you can go with this coping mechanism. The second coping mechanism families use to keep up their pay and keep up their purchasing power was everybody worked longer hours. And one thing I do remember from about 1995, 1996, when I was Secretary of Labor looking over the data, I saw that the people, were, Americans were putting in extraordinary amounts of hours. I mean, 50 hours, 60 hours, sometimes on two jobs, sometimes three jobs. Uh, overall, the typical American was working about per year 350 hours more than the typical European or even more than the enormously industrious Japanese worker. We were working and we were working and we tried to work because we wanted to maintain our standard of living and our pay, but that also has a limit. You have two spouses or parents in a family, and they're both working so hard, they're almost working on shifts. I used to use a term, I still do sometimes, to describe these parents, these couples, DINs, D-I-N-S, double income, no sex. <laughs> and then came coping mechanism number, number three. Uh, when the first two were exhausted, families went into debt. And you could do that because housing prices were going up, particularly in the first decade, or the, up to about 2007, uh, housing prices were going up very, very rapidly, so you could use home equity loans, uh, you could refinance, you could pull out of your homes like ATMs. I mean, homes became ATMs. Uh, and between 2002 and 2007, something like $2.3 trillion were pulled out of homes by Americans who wanted to treat their homes as piggy banks. Because again, that too was a coping mechanism. But that was not sustainable either. That debt bubble, that housing bubble burst. And so we are now at the end of the line. No more coping mechanisms. Now the question I began to ask myself as I started working on this book, and I, it really, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a distillation of about three or four years of, of thinking about the issue and, and worrying about it and working on it, uh, even before the Great Recession, but the Great Recession sort of forced me to put everything together. Uh, the real question I started to ask myself was, wait a minute, if, if wages flattened, if middle class wages flattened, uh, I knew that the American economy continued to grow. Where did all the money go? Class. 
Where did it go? It went to the top. Now, now, hear me out, because when I say something like this, people immediately worry. They, they accuse me of being a class warrior. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm not blaming anybody. I, I, it's perfectly fine that people make a lot of money. I, I, I'm a class warrior, W-O-R-R-I-E-R. I worry about what happens to a society and also an economy when you have that much going to the top. In fact, by 2007, the top 1% was getting about 23.5% of total national income. Now by contrast, just by contrast, by the late 70s when all this started, the top 1% was getting 9% of total national income. So you see, I mean, you go from 9% of total national income and then gradually more and more of the growth, as everybody else is stagnating, more and more of the gains of growth are going to the top. So by 2007, 23.5% of total national income. Almost a quarter is going to the top. And the problem is, the problem is when so much is going to the top, the middle, the vast middle class, inevitably, invariably, lacks the purchasing power it needs to keep the economy going. People at the top don't spend nearly as much or high a percentage of their income as people in the middle. People at the top save a lot, which in many cases is good, but that doesn't keep the economy going. It doesn't generate jobs. You don't have to be a confirmed Keynesian to understand that you have to have enough demand in the economy to actually create jobs. And once those coping mechanisms start dropping off and start being exhausted, and once the middle class really doesn't have the wherewithal to continue to buy, you've got a real economic problem. You know, as I was going through the numbers, as I was going through all of this, it struck me that there must be a parallel here with the Great Depression. I, I mean, these are two very different times in American history, but there are very interesting and important parallels. And so I went back to the data, and it turns out that there was one other year in American history in the last 100 years that is, in which we know the top 1% took home around 23.5% of total national income. Another peak year. Before it and after it, nowhere near. But it concentrated. Incomes began to concentrate right at the top one other time in the last 100 years, and that year was 1928. So, in other words, the, the, the question has to be asked, is there a relationship between what happened in 1929 and what happened in 2008? Probably not a direct relationship, but I came across a, a book written by a fan, fellow named Mariner Eccles. Uh, how many of you here know who Mariner Eccles is? Two of you? Well, let me give you a hint. Uh, the Federal Reserve Building in Washington, this big, uh, long, white, mausoleum-like structure on, on Constitution Avenue, uh, where the Fed is headquartered, the National Fed, where Ben Bernanke and everybody uh, does all of the stuff that they do, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee meets, as it did last Tuesday, uh, that is the Eccles Building, called the Eccles Building. It's named after Mariner Eccles. Does that give you a hint? Uh, actually, I asked some, a friend recently who works at the Fed, I said, uh, do you know who Mariner Eccles was? And she said, who? <laughs> now, Mariner Eccles was the chairman of the Fed from 1934 to 1948. Huge period of time and a very critical period of time in terms of the national economy, you can imagine, and also the history of the Fed. Uh, Mariner Eccles uh, wrote a book that today nobody seems to know about. I, I found it in the library, but uh, I looked at, you know, how you look at who's checked out the book, and nobody had checked it out in something like 10 years. Uh, Mariner Eccles wrote a book that explained, to at least his satisfaction, the origins of the Great Depression. And Mariner Eccles, and I, I refer to this, in fact, the first chapter in my book actually talks about Mariner Eccles. He's a fascinating character. He was the leading industrialist in America 
between 1915 and 1933, west of the Rocky Mountains. He was the number one, the richest. He had more banks and more industries, and he was the, he was actually number one of, he was, he was one of 21 children. Uh, a Mormon family, his father came from uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, Mariner uh, just had a knack for business. And uh, another interesting thing about him is that in 1933, I mean, he, the Depression just blew him away. He, it just, it, he was shocked. He never thought anything like that could happen. Uh, not only, he, his, he was a good enough businessman that he kept everything together. He didn't lose money. Uh, but uh, he thought, he assumed that after the crash of 29, uh, he would, that the thing would be over. It would reverse itself. In 1930, 31, uh, dragged on. And Mariner, he, he kind of had a, a crisis of confidence in terms of his beliefs about the economy. He had a what might be called a, uh, a, a, a kind of a, a moment, a, a, a midlife crisis, or maybe you, you want to uh, call it a, an Alan Greenspan moment of, <laughs> oh my God, I've, I've thought all, everything I believed is wrong. Uh, and uh, he went to Washington in 1933, before FDR was, uh, became president. Uh, this was in f January of 1933. In those days, presidents would take over in March. And so FDR took over in March. Uh, Herbert Hoover was still president. And in 1933, in January, he was called to testify, Mariner Eccles, because he was a leading industrialist, to, ask, to explain what happened and what should be done. And uh, Mariner Eccles, the testimony is brilliant. I hope you have a chance someday to read it. Uh, because Mariner Eccles said, what we need to do is make up for this aggregate demand that's been lost. We've got, government has got to spend a great deal of money. We've got to go deep into debt in order to counter the uh, private sector's deleveraging, and that's what the private sector was doing. Uh, and we've got to have a minimum wage, and we've got to have social insurance. Uh, we've got to have social insurance that provides uh, unemployment insurance and, and social security. Uh, and we've got to, and Mariner Eccles in this testimony went through the entire New Deal. He went through. He foresaw the entire New Deal. And what's amazing about this is that when Roosevelt took over as president, Roosevelt was a budget balancer. Roosevelt didn't believe in the New Deal. When he started, Roosevelt was still doing exactly what the economists were telling Herbert Hoover to do, balance the budget. Are you clapping for balancing the budget? <laughs> And, 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 what's, and, and, and again, Mariner Eccles foreshadowed even Keynes. Keynes had not, did not publish year, until his general theory about what the government has to do to make up for the loss of purchasing power. Years later, Mariner Eccles saw it all. And Mariner Eccles, when he thought about what caused the Great Depression, a few years later, he said it was because income became so concentrated at the top by the late 1920s, that the vast middle class no longer had the purchasing power they needed to keep the economy going without going deeper and deeper into debt. Sound familiar? He also said something else that sounded very familiar to me, that when you have so much wealth and income concentrated at the top, the top, are, what are they going to do with it? They are likely to take it and speculate in stocks, and in commodities, and in other things, hoping that other similarly wealthy and rich people will join them and bid up the prices of various, various stocks and commodities and real estate, and that that will create another bubble, that there will be a debt bubble and a speculative bubble, and they will all pop, and they will probably pop at about the same time. This is Mariner Eccles understanding the Great Depression, but he could have been writing about the Great Recession. We learned one of two important lessons from the Great Depression. The first and most important lesson we learned was when you are on the edge of a financial crisis, as we were in 2008, what you've got to do is flood the economy with money. You've got to reduce interest rates. You've got to have a stimulus. You've got to bail out banks. You've got to do whatever you have to do. Just flood everything with money so you have a lot of liquidity. So you don't have what happened in 1929 and 1930 with everybody got so scared there was a liquidity crisis. We learned that lesson. 
Larry Summers and Obama and Tim Geithner and everybody, we learned that lesson. We did it. But we did not learn the second lesson. The second lesson, in some sense, over the long term, is more important. And the second lesson from the Great Depression is that when there is such a concentration of income and wealth at the top, that the economy is so unbalanced that there's not enough aggregate demand that you are instilling and encouraging a degree of speculation at the same time, what you have to do is reorganize and restructure the economy so that the vast middle class, defined very broadly, shares a greater portion of the gains of economic growth. And that's indeed what Franklin D. Roosevelt did. He took, ultimately, Mariner Eccles' ideas and added in a few others, like, for example, the Wagner Act of 1935 that legalized collective bargaining and unions, reorganized and restructured the entire economy, a 40-hour work week with time and a half for overtime. All of these things added to the bargaining power of the middle class. And also, eventually, when we could, after World War II, after the New Deal, under Truman and under Eisenhower, we expanded access to education, access to public higher education, huge programs. I am teaching at what I believe to be, right now at Berkeley, the preeminent institution of public higher education in the United States. Yes? And also we did, we, we built highways, the highway building program of the 1960s, the GI Bill before that. We could go on, we could list it, and eventually the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, equal, equal opportunity, equalizing opportunity, investments, but we did it. We did it in the 30s, 40s, 50s, we continued right into the 60s. We as a society gained enormously from those investments, from reorganizing the economy to provide more bargaining power for the middle class, the working class, as we used to call it, the poor, and then what happened? That's the interesting question. Now, you can look at this and say, well, I know what happened. What happened was globalization, um, outsourcing. Yes, well, that's true. What also happened was technological change such that a lot of jobs were displaced by automation. Remember, there used to be bank tellers. Anybody remember bank tellers? <laughs> you remember? Telephone operators, I say this to my students, I say, do you remember telephone operators? And they look blankly, and I say, what do you think the O was doing on that telephone? Uh, do you remember service station attendants? Anybody remember service station attendants? Put up your hands, service station attendants? Oh, here's one, okay. Do you remember service station attendants who would come out in uniform? Anybody remember uniform service station? This is an old group of people here. <laughs> Uh, but even, even, even manufacturing, even factories, there's a sort of a, a kind of a love affair people still have uh, with manufacturing. Uh, but, uh, and, but not too long ago, I was invited out to the Midwest, a state. The governor was opening up a new factory that had been lured with taxpayer money, lots of taxpayer money, subsidies, from Europe to go to his state largely because not only did he want the jobs, but he didn't want another governor who was competing for that factory to get it. Uh, and he invited me out because I was a former Secretary of Labor to help with the ribbon cutting ceremony to say some nice words. Uh, and I, when I got out there, this factory was humming at high speed. It was, it was at full capacity. It was very impressive, beautiful, beautiful factory. But I made the mistake of going into the factory to see all these new jobs. There were 12. They were technical jobs. They were technicians who were sitting behind computer consoles. And those computer consoles were connected to robotics and numerically controlled machine tools. Forget the old assembly line, the old intensive, labor-intensive assembly line. Those are gone. Technology, it's not just globalization. It's also technology that has continued to displace routine workers. But the interesting mystery and the interesting part of this story is not so much technological displacement and globalization. We know that. 
The interesting thing is that once we knew what was going on, and we did by the 70s, early 1980s, I was writing about it, many people were writing about it, politically, we did nothing to restore the prospects of the broad, middle class, working class of America. We could have increased their bargaining power in terms of the unionized sectors that were protected from international competition. We could have increased the marginal tax rate on the top. Uh, we could have provided better educational opportunities, invested more in education and job training, public higher education, early childhood education. We could have invested more in infrastructure. We could have had, we could have built jobs in the United States, rebuilt the United States in terms of a crumbling infrastructure. We could have done all these things, but we did just the reverse. We deregulated. We privatized. We lowered the marginal income tax rates on the top. In fact, if you wanted a menu of all the things that you would not want to do when the gap was growing between the rich and everybody else, we did exactly the opposite. Part of the reason that most Americans allowed this to happen has to do with the coping mechanisms that I talked about a moment ago. People adapted. There was not a great deal of anger. There was not a great deal of anguish. We had recessions, we had uh, a business cycle. Uh, people did, kind of lost track of the deep underlying structural thing that was happening in terms of all the income going to the top. And we had also a dominant ideology, an ideology that said government is bad, markets are good, and that ideology took firm hold of us. And now we are beginning to pay the price. There are many things that can be done, many things that should be done. I wrote this book, and I have a lot of specifics in the book about what we need to do now. And I'm not going to give them to you now, because that would be giving away the plot, and you wouldn't want to buy the book. Why would I do that? <laughs> but I also want to answer some other, and at least anticipate some questions you may have. Because as I said before, economics is related to politics and vice versa. When you have a lot of people who are angry and frustrated and worried, concerned about not only their well-being, but their children and their families. When you have a great deal of economic insecurity, suddenly, because bills have to be paid, even if income is not coming in, bills have to be paid. When you have all of that, we see in American history, we see it in world history, it's not rocket science. It is possible for demagogues to come along and blame immigrants, or blame international trade, or blame Muslims, or blame foreigners, or blame anybody. It's, it becomes the politics of blame, the politics of resentment, looking for easy answers, easy scapegoats. It is not hard to channel anger, especially when people begin to think that the dice are loaded, that the, game, the playing field is tilted. And once people saw the bailout of Wall Street, that to me was the final tipping point. If you have a lot of people who are economically anxious and are going down and they're seeing their homes and their savings and their jobs all potentially jeopardized, and then you see Wall Street being bailed out, what do you get? You get something that is now colloquially called a Tea Party movement. But it is not just anti-government. It is a deep set fear that those in power are doing something that is antithetical to the rest of us. And some of it's right wing, but some of it is left wing as well. Uh, you know, the Smoot-Hawley tariff in the 1930s uh, was uh, supported by a lot of people on the left as well as a lot of people by the right. Uh, what you have is isolationism, and you have jingoism, you have nativism, you have xenophobia, what you have is a reactionary politics because you don't have a politics of reform. And what you have 
really in a society in times like this is a contest between the reformers and the demagogues, a contest between genuine restructuring of a society so more people have more opportunities and feel more vested interest in that society, or on the other hand, the demagogues who are reactionaries and will use the fear for their own political purposes. And we already see the beginning of that. Now, I could have written a book, in fact, I'm not sure I could have, it would have been very, very difficult. I, I can write, I like to write, but and I, had, I had actually, a couple of years ago, contemplated the possibility of writing a book that argued for a more equal society in terms of equal opportunity, a greater sharing of the fruits of prosperity from what we have now on the basis of morality, common morality, common decency, a, a kind of a, a American values. But, it seemed to me, given the politics that I saw when I was in Washington, a politics that has only grown more intense, that is lobbying and money. I'm not talking now about the demagogic politics. That is there as well. But I'm talking about a politics that is really the fruit. When you have a lot of money and wealth going to the top, inevitably, power also goes there. Power in terms of power over legislators. Money, lobbying. Washington, D.C. is a different place today from when it was when I first went there in 1967. I was there again in the, in the 1970s. I was there again in the 1990s. Every time I went to Washington, it became richer, more glittery, uh, more beautiful bistros and gorgeous hotels and fabulous restaurants and property values that soared, I mean, more than every place else in the country. During the Great Recession, everybody else lost some of their property value, not Washington, not the counties surrounding Washington, D.C. Why? Money has poured into Washington, mainly from corporations, big corporations, from Wall Street, from wealthy individuals. Uh, there is a tremendous desire, and we've seen it during the Obama administration, not surprisingly, to hold on to what you have and maybe enhance what you have. That is not surprising. Again, I'm not blaming people individually, exactly. <laughs> GM, I don't know how many of you saw this. A couple of days ago it was announced that GM has spent $94,000 in this election cycle. No, maybe it was 94 million. No, 94,000 in this election cycle so far uh, on candidates and somebody asked GM, well, why are you doing that? Because the public owns, owns GM, and isn't it sort of a circular logic that GM is using the public's money to influence the election? And the GM uh, public affairs professional who's in charge of all this lobbying and all of this donating money to candidates said, well, we have to do it in order to maintain our competitive position which is an odd thing to say given that GM's competitive position was sustained because we bailed GM out. But put that to one side. I wrote the book because I wanted to make the argument to people who have a lot of wealth and a lot of power that it is in their interest to support reform rather than reaction. It's in their reaction interest in two respects. One respect is they will do better having a smaller portion of an economy that is growing rapidly and buoyantly than a large share, as they do now, of an economy that is almost dead in the water. And you look at the 1950s and 60s and you can see that. And secondly, politically, they will do better if they have a politics that is more positive and less isolationist and less reactionary than they will if they succumb to the forces of reaction, or if the society does. So my goal in this book is not only to have the general reader understand what's happening and what needs to happen, but also to convince many with wealth and power that they have an interest in choosing from between reform or reaction, reform. I am very optimistic. No, I really am. I, uh, some of your faces are very skeptical, but let me, 
but I'm going to conclude on this note. I'm optimistic because I have seen, I've been in Washington, and I've seen Washington turn on a dime. And I am also a student of American history. And I have seen again and again, when it comes to a choice between reform and reaction, we generally choose reform. We roll up our collective sleeves. We do not indulge in ideology. We put ideology aside, and we get on with what has to be done. The question is, how much do we need to see? How much proof do we need that the choice is between the kind of reforms I'm talking about and reaction before people are mobilized at the top and everywhere else in society to support genuine reform? That's the question. Yeah. So uh, the question is, you, you referred first of all to uh, the two movies, Oliver, uh, the Oliver Stone, the Greed is Good, uh, Gordon Gecko, and then the new movie, Greed is Now Legal, uh, and what do I think of an administration, presumably the Obama administration, that is hiring people from the street, uh, and uh, many of those same people from the street uh, were the same. Well, actually, uh, the, 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 interestingly, the Obama administration is perceived as having hired a lot of Wall Streeters, uh, but even Tim Geithner, uh, he was president of the New York Fed, but he did not actually work on Wall Street. Uh, the administration has been criticized, and it is being criticized by the big business community and Wall Street as having not enough people who know business and who are Wall Street insiders. But I take your point. Uh, your concern, and I've heard it before, is that a lot of the people, particularly on the economic staff, were too close to the way of thinking that permitted all of that Wall Street and certain people like our beloved Larry Summers uh, and Bob Rubin, uh, and uh, you know they were right there allowing the Glass-Steagall Act and, and, in fact, telling Congress uh, that we ought to get rid of the Glass-Steagall Act and telling Brooksley Bourne at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission that uh, she shouldn't worry about, about uh, any of the things she was worrying about in terms of derivatives, and we know that story. Okay, other questions? Oh, I didn't answer your question. Uh, uh, no, the, the answer to the question is I, I think that the people who Obama hired are very, were very, are very good people. I mean, they, they, they I, I, I think they tried really hard. Uh, and I will, as we get into questions, give you my rendition of what the failure has been, if you'd like. But I don't want to take up other questions. Uh, well, let me let me uh, let me take your question and let me ask you because there's there we don't have much time for questions. So if you could, when you ask a question, ask a question. But your question was, uh, you don't understand why it is that so many people who are uh, working class or middle class or poor uh, who uh, would not benefit from the policies that they are voting for or at least uh, allowing to happen uh, do vote for them or allow them to happen, and and why do they not understand their own interest? You might be asking. Uh, for example, uh, and, uh, and, and the answer is a little bit complicated, but part of the answer was understood by Mariner Eccles, because Mariner Eccles, back in the early uh, 1930s, decided, and according to his memoirs, he did not want to be part of a system in which so much wealth, so much influence, so much income, so much power was concentrated in the hands of so few people who could manipulate public opinion and thereby bring on, eventually, the forces of social destruction. As people suddenly woke up and said, wait a minute, the game is rigged. That's what Mariner Eccles said. Because it is possible with enough wealth and power and money to manipulate people into thinking something. That, I mean, this is not new. Walter Lippmann understood that public opinion can be manipulated. And so the estate tax can turn into the death tax. And people can think that the Obama health care bill is about death panels. I mean, if there is, uh, and George Orwell understood this, if, if people who oppose something, if the forces of reaction are very disciplined and they use the same terminology and they have enough money behind them, they can manipulate public opinion. On the other hand, if the public has the right information in a way that the public can understand. The public can exercise and mobilize and energize themselves in ways that are very, very useful. Uh, last year, let me just give you one small factoid. Last year, 2009, uh, not a great year for most Americans, uh, the 25 top hedge fund managers 
earned an average of $1 billion each and paid 17% income tax. Now, tell me why it is that in this debate over whether the Bush tax cuts should be extended for the top 2% or for the bottom 98%, nobody mentions, nobody mentions that by taking the capital gains rate from 20% to 15%, which is what Bush did, what you were essentially doing is for a lot of not just the billionaires, but a lot of extraordinarily rich people on Wall Street who make their living in hedge funds and in, in private equity management, you are basically allowing them to get away with calling their income capital gains, and you are having them have a capital gains rate or an income tax rate that is the same thing that people pay at $30,000. And what we could do with, a, with all that, if it were taxed in a progressive way, I mean a billion dollars, a thousand million dollars, a billion dollars would pay the salaries of 20,000 teachers. I'm not suggesting we tax it at 100%, I'm just giving you a way of thinking about a billion dollars. Well, uh, the question is, uh, what's the relationship between what I said, economics and politics and the concentration of income and wealth, uh, and what the Supreme Court did, that grotesque decision. It is one of the most grotesque decisions, I think, in American history. I would put it right up there. <laughs> you know, with Dred Scott and maybe uh, Bush against Gore. I mean, the, the, these are... <laughs> These are, decisions that will, these are decisions that will live in infamy of the Federal Election Commission versus uh, the, what was it, uh, oh, the uh, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Uh, to say that corporations are people and that corporations therefore have First Amendment rights and that anything that corporations therefore want to say for or against candidates, there is no limit and under the First Amendment uh, on what that can be, what they can do. Well, there, I have not... I have not seen a better argument for replacing several members of the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Roosevelt did threaten to pack the court. I'm not suggesting that that's what Obama should do. Uh, but in those days, it's very interesting, uh, when Roosevelt made that threat uh, to expand the number of Supreme Court justices and get a, a, a court that would actually support the New Deal, uh, before he even made the threat, this is a little known historical fact, so that you can leave here knowing a little bit of history that you might not have known. Uh, Justice Roberts. There was a Justice Roberts on that court, not any relation to the current Justice Roberts. There was a Justice Roberts on that court who actually, not because of the threat to pack, this is before Roosevelt made that threat, that Justice Roberts shifted his vote to the minority. So it became 5-4 in favor of the New Deal. So even without the court packing, everybody, historians think there was the court packing threat that shifted the New Deal. No, no, it was actually Justice Roberts on his own because he started to think this is wrong. We're not going to get that kind of thinking from the present <laughs> Justice Roberts. Uh, yes. I, one of my proudest moments, I testified in Congress against Justice, the, the, the confirmation of Justice Roberts. Thank you. I don't know. I can't speak for other academia. Uh, but I can say, uh, in, in, in all fairness uh, to, the, to economics, uh, I mean, you, know, so you see, economics and history and politics and even ethics uh, used to be all part of the same discipline. Uh, in the 18th century, Adam Smith did not call himself an economist. He called himself uh, a, a moral philosopher. And then in the 19th century, there was still no discipline called economics. It was political economy. And, and again, it was the study of the organization of society. It wasn't until 1890 when Alfred Marshall, wonderful, famous, fabulous economist, a theoretician, uh, wrote his Principles of Economics that the whole study of economics really divorced itself from history and politics and ethics. Uh, and I do not imply any criticism of economics at all, but I do think that in order to understand the kinds of phenomenon we are dealing with, the structural changes, you've got to understand politics and history, and you have to understand public morality, the, the kind of social psychology that sets in. And that's just not something that a lot of economists are very interested in. Uh, is it possible that, that things have to get much worse 
before uh, people see. see that the choice is reform or reaction and choose reform. Things have gotten yes, it worse, may. But it's been very quiet. Yeah, it, it may be. Uh, it may be that things do have to get worse. I, don't, I hope they don't get much worse. Uh, in the book, I posit, I look ahead 10 years uh, to the election of uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2020. And I, I kind of uh, do a scenario about what happens. Uh, who are the candidates? Uh, I offer that uh, the Republican candidate is George P. Bush. <laughs> and the Democratic candidate is, is Chelsea Clinton. Uh, and, they both, and they both lose. And they lose to someone named Margaret Jones. And Margaret Jones's platform is a platform that, although some of you here might find some of the platform principles appealing, it is one of the most dangerous platforms you can imagine. And I think that's where we are going if we don't choose reform. But again, I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> the, uh, after 1935, uh, and we had the Wagner Act and we legalized collective bargaining, uh, we had still a, a, a struggle. Uh, the legalization of collective bargaining didn't mean the end of a struggle between management and labor. It wasn't until the 1950s uh, that we had a new generation of, of labor union leaders, but we also had an organization of the economy with big, big oligopolistic uh, companies, three major auto manufacturers, five major chemical manufacturers, uh, uh, six major, three major in, uh, steel manufacturers. And because it was so oligopolistic and centralized, it was possible for the unions in those industries to convince management to go along and pass on those unionized, high wage, high benefit costs to consumers, basically, and still come out ahead because economies of scale paid for much of those higher wages. But what happened after 1980? It wasn't just that Ronald Reagan legitimized union busting by firing the air traffic controllers, who actually had no right to strike, legally anyway. No, what happened after 1980 was that we simply turned our backs. We simply said, uh, let the market do what it's going to do. Uh, we not only allowed employers to go after unions and to go after unions very illegal ways, but the reason that employers went after unions is because non-union competitors were doing better and better and better. Americans were buying uh, a lot of stuff, not only from abroad, but also from the South, uh, from right-to-work states, so-called, and the unionized sector of the American economy kept on shrinking because of that. It was a combination of employers going after unions, uh, firing workers who were trying to form unions, bringing in striker replacements, but also watching as more and more Americans chose cheaper non-unionized goods, and so that we had 33%, almost 33% of Americans who were unionized in 1953, which was a high enough percentage that basically it set prevailing wages across the country because even the non-unionized employers were afraid if they didn't go along with prevailing wages in those union contract agreements, they would be the next to be unionized. We went from that to today fewer than 8% in the private sector workers who were unionized. So essentially unions have no real bargaining clout, but they could have bargaining clout if they were focused, as SEIU and HERE and others are, have been trying to focus on the personal service sector of the economy that is not subject to either global competition or too much automation. I'm talking about retail, restaurant, hotel, hospital, surface transportation, construction, child care, elder care. Uh, there are a lot of areas of the economy, a lot of jobs that don't have to worry, where you could actually unionize. And so, yes, that's part of the puzzle. That's part of what we need to do. Uh, the question is, uh, to what extent has movie money moved abroad as well as up? Uh, well, part of the process of, moving, of money moving up is that when you have a lot of savings that are savings by wealthy people who basically, <laughs> they, they can't, they run out of things to spend their money on and they do want to save, they are going to put those savings anywhere around the world where they can get the highest return. 
And so you have a global capital market, uh, not only American savings, you actually obviously have German and Japanese and Chinese and oil producing savings as well. And all of those savings are sloshing around and they are making, uh, particularly if banks as intermediaries don't pay much attention, did make it very cheap for Americans to borrow for a while. And right now, it is still pretty cheap to borrow, but lending standards are different than they were. Uh, my major point in the book is that China will not be our savior. A lot of people in the administration right now, and I was in Washington yesterday having some discussions with a bunch of people, and every time I, I talked about the themes in the book, they said, oh yes, well, American consumers can't do it anymore. American consumers are over. The era of American consumers be providing enough aggregate demand is over, but we can, we can count on China and India and Brazil. They'll do it. No. Read today's headlines. Uh, can I point to a national economy that is doing it right and providing a good living for a majority of its people? Uh, well, uh, look, uh, it depends on what you mean by good, uh, doing it right. If you want to go back to the kind of widely shared prosperity America had in the 50s and 60s and early 1970s, uh, you don't have to go very far. You can just go north. You know, Canada is not a bad example. Uh, Canada uh, was not nearly as hurt by the Great Recession. Uh, you know, who, which European nation, apart from Greece and uh, Spain and a few others uh, whose, whose budgets were way out of whack and they were hurt by the common, basically the European Union having a common monetary policy, but which European unions, big, which big European nations uh, have been clobbered the worst? Well, the worst, the one that was clobbered the worst is the one that w with the widest inequality, and that is Great Britain. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. It's great to be back in Cambridge. These are, you are my neighbors and you are my friends and please buy a book. Thank you. <laughs>